Kodiak Island, near the Alaskan Peninsula. Divers and filmmakers of the Calypso have come to these northern waters to observe and record for the first time in history the complete saga of the perilous migration of the red sockeye salmon. After surviving four years of danger and adventure far out in the open sea, these dauntless fish will now meet new perils as they heed an irresistible call to return to the fresh waters of their birth. Tracked by the men of the Calypso, the salmon are coming home to spawn. A series of incredible challenges await the salmon as they seek their way through an often hostile wilderness. But Calypso cameramen will find them determined travelers as they follow the tragic odyssey of their punishing journey home. Red sockeye salmon, the long journey home begins in Alga Bay and will take them through Alaska's vast Kodiak Island wilderness all the way up the Salmon River to remote Fraser Lake. It was in the headwaters of the Salmon River and the feeder streams of Fraser Lake that they were born five years before. And it is to Fraser Lake that the salmon must now return to spawn. Beset by natural obstacles and predators, for the salmon it will be a tortuous and perilous journey upstream. It is also a journey that at one time no salmon ever traveled. The hands of man carefully planted fertilized salmon eggs in this lake, which since the beginning of the world had never seen the presence of even a single one of these fish. In populating the lake, man raises himself to the level of a god and thus becomes responsible for the lives that begin here. Fraser Lake, for one year they would build their strength, then embark on their great voyage to the ocean. After four years at sea, they returned to spawn. And man, the prime predator, is waiting for them. Nets and saints prematurely end the journey for one out of four of these homeward travelers. Modern fishing methods are becoming frightfully efficient and could soon endanger the species. Support must be given to fish and game scientists who are experimenting with various methods to help restore this magnificent bounty of the sea. We of the Calypso enter Alaskan waters with the spring run of salmon. We are trying to understand better the life of the salmon including their mystifying return from thousands of miles at sea.
Some believe the salmon have a sun compass mechanism. Maybe they are able to sense magnetic fields and the rotation of the Earth. Recently, scientists have suggested that the salmon might also be sensitive to variations in gravity, which are imprinted in their memories to help them find their way home. Yet, masters in precise navigation, they are unable to avoid man's traps. Bernard Delmotte gives the salmon freedom. But the salmon's drive is so strong to return to the mouth of his native river that he swims right back into the net. From the open sea, the salmon has traveled untiringly 30 miles a day, day and night, to reach this point. Those that got away, the red salmon that escaped the nets, will now be followed by Cousteau's team of divers and filmmakers as the fish make their way toward the Salmon River. Now they would record the results of the experimental egg planting at Fraser Lake, the completion of the cycle begun five years before. Into the wilderness area, my men look for a run of salmon. Like all Pacific salmon, theirs is a once-in-a-lifetime migration, and they will spawn only once. This sets them apart from most other fish and has long intrigued us. Salmon school where fresh water mixes with salt water from the inland bay. They swim back and forth to become acclimated to the fresh water. Here, they begin to lose some of their blue back deep sea coloration and go through a physiological change before they rush upriver. They follow the fish in the zodiac, which runs into a rocky riverbed, and horsepower is replaced by manpower. Bernard Delamotte is first to fall victim to the vicious Arctic mosquito, while Yves Omer hasn't yet found his land legs. The expedition is an unusual treat for our men of the Calypso. As much as they love the ocean, they have missed the mountains, grass, the feel of the ground. Soon, the first signs that tragedy travels with the salmon. Halfway between the entrance of the river and the waterfall ahead, these fish have dropped behind, wounded by the nets, which continue to take their toll. Calypso de Racal 1, Calypso de Racal 1, je suis en, sur le canal 5, je suis sur le canal 5. The men report to Cousteau, now en route to the Bering Sea. Racal de Calypso, Racal de Calypso. Nous vous recevons fort et net. Bon, Guy, alors, the Calypso's radio bon man, asks how they are. Bernard answers that even public enemy number one could not be worse than the flies and mosquitoes. Cousteau wants to know if Yves has begun to film the upstream migration of the red salmon. 
il a vu le groupement des saumons, le rassemblement des saumons qui commence à devenir assez important, assez important. They have seen a school assembling and they will now get ready to film their grand rush toward the lake. De la remontée vers le lac, de la remontée vers le lac dans les quelques jours qui viennent. Plagued by mosquitoes and on the watch for bears, of which there are 2,500 browns on Kodiak Island, the team approaches the rapids where the salmon have been assembling. Well short of their goal, the migrating salmon are suddenly stopped by tier after tier of forbidding rocks. Beneath the 60-foot falls, there are thousands of salmon waiting their turn to jump. Reaching them presents a unique challenge to Evo Mare, underwater cameraman, now become aerialist. The current here is overpowering. The spring runoff from mountain snow and ice packs is a frigid 40 degrees. It is almost like diving in the Arctic. Albert Falco unties the underwater camera. Eve is now in a position to attack the falls from the flank. A generator will provide sufficient light to film an unprecedented view of salmon in struggle. Transformations in the fish have begun. Bernard examines the teeth of a male. They have started to grow and will soon fiercely protrude. The salmon's bodies are turning red, their heads turning green. The females are growing rounded, distended with roe, while the mouths of the males are changing into hooked, menacing snouts. The extraordinary might of the falls is unexpected, and for both fish and men, the stunning impact of pounding tons of ice water. The salmon are now fueled by stored fats. They have not eaten since they entered fresh water, and they will never eat again for the entire agonizing completion of their life's mission. Bernard Delamotte and Yves Homer work into the night hour after hour in the icy water that freezes divers even through foam rubber suits. But more and more they are becoming personally involved in the ordeals of the courageous fish. The salmon rest by night. Tomorrow's to come will reveal their fate. The Calypso expedition team sets up camp at the base of the 60-foot falls because it is here that the migrating salmon have been delayed. In the Kodiak Island wilderness, the trick is to get up before the mosquitoes, and perhaps a fire with authority will help keep them at their distance. If one is to bathe in the stream, one must do so early. 
where the Arctic mosquitoes will fly 35 miles for a meal. And they are particularly fond of Bernard. Bernard swims with sharks, rides whales, tames moray eels, but is defeated by mosquitoes. Captain Cousteau is filming walruses off St. Lawrence Island. Now they must contact him to let him know they have stopped at the falls instead of going on to the lake. Allô, Rakala. Allô, Rakala. Bonjour à tous. À vous. Bonjour, commandant. Nous sommes en train de filmer le rassemblement des saumons. Bernard reports that they have begun to film the growing concentration of salmon and their incredible attempt to clear the falls. The divers have problems handling underwater cameras and lights in the overwhelming current. I could not help abandoning my walruses at least temporarily, to observe the salmon at first hand. What teases the mind of the scientist is how the salmon can make such magnificent leaps from such a shallow basin. Cousteau calculates that to jump six feet high, the salmon must leave the water at about 25 kilometers, or 15 and a half miles per hour. How can they generate so much momentum with so little space? They will visit the base of the falls and Bernard will have to investigate. School children learn that salmon are instinctively driven to return to where they were born. But when you actually see their determination, when you touch the difficulties, then you just can't believe it. The wall of water and stone that confronts these resolute fish is absolutely awesome. So as not to be swept away by the overpowering current, Bernard must add a rock to his weight belt. A moment between man and fish. Then with superb hydronomic efficiency, we see the salmon live up to his name, Salmo the Leaper. Bernard reports on the salmon's ability to jump. The wall of water falling among the rocks creates a strong turbulence. In this turmoil, each time a backwash swirls in the proper direction, the salmon takes advantage of it and leaps out. Now Cousteau understands that in spite of the fact that the salmon have little room to gain momentum, it is the use of the backwash that enables them to break surface at 15 to 20 miles per hour. But the fish jump in vain. When in Fraser Lake, man gave them birth, he did not take into account the enormity of the falls. And those that revive return to the falls in a futile attempt to try them again. What is unbelievable to Cousteau is that the fish are so strongly obligated to return to the place they were born when they could as well mate downstream. But no, they persist, he says. They refuse to yield. They mutilate themselves, commit suicide to reach their spawning grounds upstream.
In his desire to populate the lake, man was well-intentioned, but he has wrought a tragic change in the orderly course of nature. A once valiant leaper returns to the sea. The plan to fertilize Fraser Lake provided for the building of a fish ladder, a step pass 190 feet high to allow the salmon to surmount the falls and reach the lake. But fish ladders are rarely totally successful. To provide a gradual ascent, the ladder was set back to one side of the falls making it difficult for the salmon to find the entrance without assistance. The Calypso team helps officials of the Alaskan Department of Fish and Game as they draw nets of confused homing salmon toward the entrance of the step pass. If the return is delayed too long, they will die here without fulfilling their purpose. The journey up the ladder will be a very tough one against a formidable current. How alien this metal and concrete box must be. The fact that fish can accept this totally unnatural environment shows the strength of their drive to return. They must be frightened all the way. But still they go on because they sense that this is the only path to reach their goal. Among the sockeye is a stray pink salmon, recognizable by the hump on his back. He's come home with the wrong salmon. After the difficult ascent, freedom from the ladder and from the falls. And now the magisterial procession upstream. For Cousteau's crew, there's a sense of freedom too, as they follow what they now consider their salmon on their way once again toward Fraser Lake. Several hours past the waterfall. Damage by large predators. For the salmon, there seem to be more perils in store. The bald eagle is an endangered species, its habitat reduced by those who care more for eagles on coin than eagles on the wing. Although to some the eagle's a bird of prey, to its own it's a good provider. And another life cycle is served. With salmon in the river, Predators come in many sizes and species, from the fox to the Kodiak killers, leaving behind a trail of mangled salmon. And there they are. The giant Kodiaks have come down from the mountains in their annual pilgrimage to the rivers, swarming with salmon. The big browns usually try to avoid man, but the female, when she has cubs to protect, is a dangerous adversary.
The Kodiak is a direct descendant of the huge cave bears of the Stone Age. Standing as tall as 10 feet, weighing up to 1,800 pounds, he is the largest bear in existence, even larger than the grizzlies. He fishes haphazardly for he's extremely nearsighted, and it is often by guesswork that he catches a salmon. We are the intruders. The bear is in his rightful place here in the wilderness, inherited from his ancestors. For the bear, food is here plentiful, and he wastes a lot, as often happens when there is abundance at hand. As the spawners run the gauntlet, the toll is heavy. Eggs that will never hatch, cast off too soon. Cousteau's men continue on toward Fraser Lake, the stream alive with migrant survivors. At Red Lake, to the northwest, men from the Alaskan Department of Fish and Game are moving fish, endlessly striving to increase the natural productivity of Kodiak Island's river and lake system. Spawners newly arrived from the sea are to be transported by air to a nearby lake that was totally depopulated by man's greed. The question is whether or not displaced salmon will accept new homes. Since they are beginning to grow heavy with roux, they will have no choice but to seek out the proper, pure oxygenated streams that feed the other lake. And when they have the urge to spawn, they will do so. This cannery's nets had captured all the salmon trying to reach their lake to spawn. After five years, there were no more fish, and the cannery had to close. During the spring run of salmon, the seaplane shuttles back and forth 20 times a day, transporting 5,000 fish a week. And the lake lives again. Upon arrival at Fraser Lake, Cousteau's men of the deep are challenged by the shallows. On their long voyage to the lake, from which they now seek their specific streams, the red salmon have undergone extended stress, and they have used up most of the food they carry within them. They, too, are victims of the shallows. Back at the falls, they could jump 10 feet. Here, they can hardly negotiate a simple one-foot weir. Now it is the odors, remembered from plants and minerals, dissolved in their natal streams, that guide the salmon. They follow their noses home. The time for spawning is close at hand. A male and female enter their stream together. But a new obstacle confronts them. A spot so dry, their gills are out of water. They must return to the lake for oxygen.
Theirs is a single-minded obsession to mate upstream, after which they will remain faithful. The male manages to cross the dry spot. He stops to rest in a clogged area. The female has been left behind. Downstream, the female is alone and beached. Now the male returns to find the female. She's too confused and weak to get off the rocks. The magpie waits. The male leans on one side to wet his gills for life-sustaining oxygen and tries to reach her. Ripe with roe, the female aborts her eggs and dies. The magpie finds her feed. The male continues his attempts to reach the female's side. The male approaches the body of his companion, then passes death and struggles back to reach the lake. As for the dead companion left behind, the mood and the season were upon her, but not the place. Now that the weakened and unfulfilled male will try to mate with another, if he can reach the spawning grounds. Fraser Lake, where once there were no salmon, now populated with the artificially propagated fish, come home to spawn. At the spawning grounds, Falco makes observations as Yves Omer ingeniously operates his underwater camera by remote control so as not to encroach on the ritual as the salmon select mates. The male's teeth now protrude in permanent snarls from their hooked snouts. As in the presence of the females, they circle and size up each other, preliminary to a ferocious battle for mates. The ferocity of the fights are more to impress the rival than to kill him. In nature, it is almost non-existent that males fight to the death for the possession of the female. They could be wiser than men. A loser swims off into the shallows and the winner claims his prize, only to get a final bite on the tail from the hard loser. With rounded head and body heavy with row, the female initiates the circling love dance. The rites of spawning have begun.
Calypso, 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 Calypso de Racal, Calypso de Racalin. It's time to contact Cousteau on the Calypso, which has been through a storm in the Bering Sea. Bonjour Bernard, me recevez-vous, à vous Bernard reports that they are now at Canyon Creek, and Eve has begun to film the spawning of the salmon. Cousteau asks if they are still running into trouble with mosquitoes and flies. Bernard says that while these salmon are spawning, the flies seem to be occupied with other salmon killed by the bears. Cousteau says to be careful with the bears and that he's coming for the spawning. I am back at Fraser Lake to witness the denouement of our Salmon's drama. Nature's way of procreation is through overabundance. That's why these hardy creatures are able to return in even these decimated ranks. Out of 5,000 eggs laid by a female, 100 will successfully hatch to alvins, and of these, only 50 will reach the ocean. After four years of open sea adventures, a mere 30 survivors will try to return home. Of these, 10 will be caught by fishermen and five by predators. Fewer than 10 will reach the spawning ground. As the elected ones dash forward for their last test, we salute the epic travelers at the term of their odyssey. It is nature's wisdom rather than tragedy. The strongest have survived to spawn and live on through their progeny, thus continually improving the species. Now Cousteau's filmmaking team is ready to photograph the spawning ritual. Special camera rigs are set up for a unique film record. The ceremony begins with courtship circling, interrupted by occasional bursts of rivalry. A female protects her chosen nesting area, and the love dance continues. Obsessed by sexual purpose, the female is ready to dig her nest with powerful thrusts of her broad tail. La Ronde, prelude to egg laying. A female lays some of her eggs before cutting another nest. The male fertilizes them. His orgasm is a strong, visible shudder. A 
a female passes under her mate, brushing his body, inciting him to fertilize her eggs. And for all the spawning salmon, the process is repeated. This is the final reward for the agonizing trip. A few days of supreme excitement. After the nuptial feast, they will be ready for death. In a special enclosure, the rapid deterioration of a salmon couple after spawning is being observed closely by Eve Omer and biologist Ben Drucker. You notice, Eve, that the fish have quite a difference, different appearance now than we, when, when we saw them the last time. Their bodies are starting to turn white and they're losing their pigment. The female's tail, if you notice, is quite devoid of color and the caudal fin is frayed. It's starting to break down and this is primarily due to her digging of the nest where she uses her tail to dig out the gravel. The male, his tail is starting to change also, but this is just a breakdown in pigment, which they both actually have also. You also see it on the dorsal surface by their dorsal fin. It's starting to turn white. Now, because of all the, the cuts and the bruises and the fighting that these fish have to endure, it's very easy for bacteria and fungi to attack the fish. And on the male, you see where the male's head is starting to turn white. This is a fungus that has yes. attacked it. Of course, these fish will not live very long. They have a very short life period after they spawn. Maybe as little as four days to as long as about 10, averaging about seven. So another few days now, these fish will be completely broken down and soon the whole body will be covered with fungus. And then life is just about over. Ben, yes, uh, do you know exactly why the salmons are uh, so quickly getting old? Uh, no. Uh, physiologists are studying now the salmon, and they hope possibly to get a clue from why the salmon break down so fast, and perhaps they can relate this to the human being. As a person gets older, of course, his organs become less functional, yes. and the body kind of drops a bit. So if they study salmon, which die very fast after spawning with the degeneration of the body. Perhaps they can get some clues. The salmon's rapid deterioration causes in two weeks physiological changes that take from 20 to 40 years in man. Yes, we're, we're observing now the, the termination of the life cycle of the salmon. Mm -hmm. The female has died and the male will be dead in just a few hours now. He's taking his last breaths really. From dying salmon, scientists are gaining insight into such human diseases as heart attacks and even cancer. Significantly, it is the heart of our hero that is the last to die.
theirs has been an almost simultaneous and collective death that provides in the depths of the lake a fantastic underwater salmon graveyard. But nature is self-balancing. At once, stickleback and trout come to feed. Nutrients from the salmon's bodies will also feed the plankton of the lake. And in its turn, the plankton will provide food for the fry of our valiant red salmon, now at rest, buried in the deep waters of home. It's a new day at the spawning grounds of Fraser Lake. The major participants in the spring drama are now prepared to depart. The expedition team will return to the Calypso and the bears to their mountain homes. The gulls returned to the Gulf of Alaska and left behind is the promise of the red salmon, lying under the clean gravel of fresh flowing rivers. In an explosion of life, aggressive young salmon will jump down the waterfalls and swim to the coast. In the open sea, their four year, 4,000 mile journey was until recently concealed. But even in the ocean depth, Science is closing in upon the salmon and opening additional opportunities for fishermen of distant nations. Soon they will have no safety anywhere. Let us hope he will survive. Salmon the Magnificent, which the artist said is how a fish should look. Thank you.